Good afternoon, and welcome to this edition of HDSA and Me, a virtual educational series for the HD community. Over the next several weeks, HDSA and Me will offer thought-provoking seminars and interactive sessions that are brought to you by many of our HDSA Center of Excellence team members. Today, we welcome Drs. Laura Tallman and Amy Hiller, who will be discussing palliative care in Huntington's disease. You can send a question at any time during the presentation. Just click on the chat function in the toolbar, type your question, and hit send. Your questions will be answered at the end of the session. This presentation will be available on HDSA's YouTube channel in about a week. On October 22nd, the series will delve into the use of telemedicine in HD. You can register for this session by going to hdsa.org backslash hdsa dash me. And now a little about our speakers. Dr. Laura, Lauren Tallman joined the Oregon Health and Science University Parkinson's Center and Movement Disorders team in 2019. She is an assistant professor of neurology and is fellowship trained in movement disorders. Dr. Tallman brings a focus on multidisciplinary care to her patients and serves as an educator for patients and care partners, both in clinic and in the community. Dr. Amy Hiller is a board certified neurologist practicing movement disorders at OHSU and the Portland VA Healthcare System. She is an associate professor at OHSU and serves as the fellowship director for the Joint Movement Disorders Program at OHSU and Portland VA. Dr. Hiller has research and clinical interest in palliative care and the effects of stress on movement disorders. We are delighted to welcome Drs. Hiller and Tolman here today, and I'll turn the broadcast over to them now. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, let me get our screen going here for everybody. Um, so my name is uh, Dr. Tallman, as she just mentioned, um, and I am joined, as she said, by Dr. Hiller. Let me see if I can get my screen moving here. Might be a little bit of a delay. All right, that's working a little bit better. Okay, wonderful. Well, um, sorry about that that pause there, everybody. We're all working out the kinks in the technology these days. So um, to jump right into it, as was mentioned, Dr. Hiller and I are going to be talking to you today about a subject that's near and dear to our hearts um, and, and something that's not not often talked about, actually. And, and we felt it was helpful not only for um, you know, individuals living with Huntington's, but also those helping to care for them to really start this conversation. It's helpful for us as providers as well to gain that comfort in, in having these types of discussions. So um, this is going to be just a little bit of an introduction for you. Um, in terms of the outline of what we'll be going over today, we're going to start by talking about um, what is palliative care and, and how is it delivered to our patients. Um, additionally, in, in particular, we'll talk about some unique considerations to keep in mind in, in the setting of Huntington's disease as it relates to palliative care. Um, and lastly, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about how to structure advanced care planning when it comes to, to HD and when it might be appropriate to think about transition to hospice. Dr. Hiller will then take over for the second part of the talk to outline a few tools that we feel can help a person to gain resiliency when living with a disease such as Huntington's. Um, and if time allows, hopefully it will, she'll run you through a mindfulness exercise that she finds very helpful with her, her patients. So um, to jump right into it, sometimes I find it helpful to start by not necessarily saying what is palliative care, but talking about what it's not. Um, I think there's a lot of misconnections misconceptions and miscommunications um, and, and misunderstandings in some ways that palliative care is synonymous with hospice care or end-of-life care. Um, and we'd like to make the argument that the palliative care is, is not just hospice care. It's not specific to a particular time point in a person's disease. It's, it's really a tool that can be applied at all stages. Additionally, I think just primarily because of the fact that palliative care was born out of oncology care, there's, there's a thought that it's really only applicable to those types of diseases. But um, we certainly have more and more information that we've gathered over the years to suggest that many 
other chronic illnesses and particularly neurologic diseases like, like Huntington's can gain a lot of benefit from palliative care. In terms of a couple specific definitions, we've, we've outlined two broad definitions here for you and just want to highlight the fact that there is overlap between these two to suggest that palliative really has a focus on alleviating suffering and promoting quality of life. You're going to hear me use that term a lot throughout the course of, of this talk um, because setting goals and focusing on quality of life is really what palliative care is all about. Um, as I mentioned, this has um, implications for not just uh, cancer treatment, cancer care, certainly um, neurologic diseases can benefit from outlining these types of, of goals. When we think about how palliative care is delivered, there was um, a, a model proposed several years back by a group of clinicians and several of whom have training both in palliative care and neurology to suggest sort of a three-legged mod model for delivering palliative care. Certainly part of that model are community organizations and national organizations like HDSA, which can help to structure some of these discussions and support patients in having these difficult discussions. Um, additionally, certainly there are specialized palliative care providers, but often there, these resources aren't available at every institution or, or in every community. So often that um, role of delivering palliative care and, and discussing the tools of palliative care is, is left to primary providers or neurologists like, our, like ourselves. Um, and, and within those specialized palliative care models, there certainly are clinics devoted to this type of medic medicine, um, but additionally some home-based models of palliative care and, and certainly hospice is a subtype of, of palliative care, which we'll talk about a little bit later. The reason I put these, uh, or we chose to put these two pictures of the two types of stools, one's with, one with three legs and one with four, is that we do want to also make the point that um, families of patients with Huntington's disease are, are often uh, the movers and shakers in everyday life and, and the care partners and family members are often implementing palliative care um, day to day. When we think about delivering care to patients with Huntington's disease, this is a really nice um, ideal model, I would say. And, and at the center and heart of this model is obviously the patient. Um, but just, uh, just also remember that the individuals within the family, those caring for the patient day to day, are also centric to this model. Um, surrounding those individuals, we have various subspecialists and we we really do like to use a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach to providing care to patients with Huntington's. Um, as I mentioned, palliative care is not always a resource that is available um, with regard to a specialist in palliative care. So that type of, of care is often delivered by the other subspecialists specialists within this model, including um, neurologists like ourselves. I want to jump now into talking about what some unique considerations are when we think about applying palliative care in Huntington's disease. Um, and, and many of this I'm sure you guys know and are aware of, um, but, but I think it's really important to, to think about these things. So um, one really important thing to consider in HD is the fact that Diagnosis and, and um, time points for when a person learns of their diagnosis is really variable and, and often it, it can be earlier on in a person's uh, lifetime, sort of when they're at their prime of life, starting a career, starting a family. And so sitting down and having these types of discussions and planning out what they want their years ahead to look like and what their goals might be can be a little challenging. They just don't have that perspective at that time point in their life. Um, they may not have symptoms, as I said, so, so really keeping that perspective in mind can be challenging. 
Additionally, as we all know, HD is a family disease. So um, individuals diagnosed have often witnessed and oftentimes been a caregiver to loved ones who have also experienced the disease. And so those types of experiences certainly shape their, their own individual decisions as they relate to goals of care and palliative care. Um, it's also really important and well known to um, talk about the fact that HD affects people in different ways and, and certainly that those symptoms can evolve over time with various stages of the disease. Uh, one really large challenge both for the patient and care partners and providers is the fact that there can be personality changes and cognitive changes with level of awareness affected over time. And so the decision a person makes early on in the course of their disease, um, they may not recall that or, or be aware of that later on. So, so having the support of family to be, to be witness those types of discussions is, is crucial and, and certainly supported. When we think about when to consider having discussions and, and applying these models of palliative care, um, we would like to make the argument that um, there's no need to wait. This is not, as I said, a, um, a discussion that needs to wait until the end of disease or advanced stages of disease. In, in fact, having these discussions early, applying these um, principles early, are, is really important and really encouraged, even, even at time of diagnosis. Um, I like this breakdown of the, the priorities of palliative care because I think it gives us sort of some broad talking points. We'll get into a, a few more detailed talking points shortly, but um, when we think about the priorities of palliative care in HD, certainly as I said, it's, it's establishing goals with, with the hope of improving quality of life in the immediate future and, and beyond. Um, additionally, the, the palliative care certainly supports the caregiver, care partner, um, because respecting the, the patient's wishes in turn can certainly help lift a bit of a burden um, and, and that weight of decision making from the caregiver. Um, and, and then certainly end of life decision making is, is part of palliative care and we'll touch on that a little bit later. We, we really like the model um, proposed by uh, something called the Robert Wood Johnson Project Palliative Initiative. And this was came out of a, an initiative in the late 1990s, early 2000s with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And they basically tasked um, various groups of individuals to come up with a list of priorities that can be applied to um, uh, prioritizing quality of life in, in palliative care and sort of starting those discussions with individuals. And, and they come up with these 10 broad categories. Um, we're gonna kind of go through each of these individually um, and how they relate to a particular study that came out of these, these priorities that were established. And it's a really insightful study. It was published back, um, you know, it's about 10 years old now, but still certainly applies today. Um, and, and basically this study was performed through a group of, of nursing staff that worked at a care facility taking care of patients with hunting primarily in mid-stage to later stages of the disease. Um, and even though I'm saying these are mid to late stages of disease, um, as I've said before, a lot of these things can be applied throughout the course of, of Huntington's. Um, and they basically used those 10 priorities as a framework for, for publishing their lessons learned. Um, and we won't touch on all of these, but I just want to highlight a few. Um, to, to start, when we talk about autonomy, I think that's a really important starting point because certainly as Huntington's progresses, um, 
we do know that uh, an ability for a person to stay independent does decline over time and they require increasing assistance. And often uh, the desire a person has to maintain independence can be at conflict with their own safety. And, and so the, the nursing staff here really did come up with some, some great strategies and great observations as it relates to this. Um, I think one really nice um, tool they used is, is still providing choice to the patient, not giving them open-ended choice, but, but still giving them sort of a, a, a yes, no, or two option choice. Um, it still gives them some autonomy, but helps to preserve their safety. And one example they gave is, is for individuals who really didn't want to take a shower, they didn't want to bathe. Um, obviously, that can uh, cause safety issues with infection risk and so this nursing group decided that instead of giving them the choice do you want to take a shower today they said do you want to take a bath or a shower and so it really takes out the choice of whether they're going to bathe and, and gives them the option of, of one or the other while maintaining their their safety and hygiene I think there's a lot of overlap with from autonomy to dignity. Certainly, we as caregivers and care providers, um, along with the nursing staff who, who uh, published this information, really made that a priority to maintain dignity for individuals despite this um, progression of disease and, and perhaps loss of independence over time. Um, one point they made is that having discussions about preferences as things became more advanced to say, do we feel like staying in a comfortable place um, toward, the, toward the end of life is preferable? Um, and so they use this term dying in place as, as perhaps a, an ideal for individuals, keeping them in a comfortable comfortable place like home or, or a, a care facility. When we think about social interactions in Huntington's disease, particularly as we get into later stages and, and when folks may be more in a, in a facility, um, there, there's certainly variability. Often we see family members maintain that connection, maintain that support, but unfortunately some other folks may lose that connection with family and friends. And, and you know, for, for some individuals with HD, they, they actually prefer to be left alone. They, they do kind of pr prefer that isolation. Others seem to really appreciate constant and um, consistent interactions with particular staff or care partners. So really uh, observing what the preference is for a particular individual helps us to, to kind of keep with their wishes and their comfort level. When we think about um, communication over time in HD, certainly verbal communication can become more challenging. And so again, honing in on having consistent relationships so that people can observe what behaviors and preferences are for a particular individual um, is, is really what's recommended. Moving on to comfort, when we think about comfort, certainly pain can be an element later on in, in more advanced stages of Huntington's. Um, and we would propose having a pretty low threshold for treating that type of pain. But comfort can come in other, other flavors as well. So for some people, as I mentioned, there's, there's variable levels of comfort with social interaction. Um, the nursing staff also made the point that um, for some patients, the amount of clothing they wear is, is dictates how comfortable they are. Often um, we observe patients who just prefer to, to wear fewer clothes rather than more or um, like the temperature of their room much colder. So uh, honing in on those little details in order to uh, maintain comfort as much as possible. Um, when it comes to safety, the nursing staff seem to observe that um, having individual rooms where a person can kind of have their own space is, is certainly um, ideal. And when safety is uh, a concern, especially as it relates to fall risk, often making adaptations to the environment itself, like clearing pathways, bringing the level of the bed down so that you don't have a um, bed frame and mattress on the floor with padding on the floor. Those can be environmental changes to really keep a person um, as independent as possible, but as safe as possible as well. 
I'm not going to touch too much into spirituality because Dr. Hiller is going to be giving us some details on that a little bit later, but just suffice it to say that um, for, for individuals who do uh, prioritize spirituality, this doesn't have to come through a religious figure. It can be provided through um, staff members or family care partners. Um, and, and lastly, to, to touch on a kind of activity and enjoyment and enjoy day to day. Um, it, it certainly, we often talk about the fact that patients with HD like routine. Um, often the ability to engage in an activity is um, not something they can do for, for long periods of time, long stretches. Um, but again, focusing on close observation of what a person's preferences are, um, what types of activities they like, what types of foods they like, and really trying to um, bring that into the mix as much as possible. Um, speaking of food, that's certainly an important tool we can consider when we're thinking about uh, treatment throughout throughout the course, but also in the later stages of Huntington's. Um, these the nursing staff made some really insightful observations that um, often food itself can be just as effective, if not more effective, than medications for calming a person or um, helping them to rest, particularly at night. And then I just put this this uh, statistic in there just to kind of put it out there, the fact that um, a little less than a quarter of the patients that were studied in this in this paper um, chose to have alternative means of, of getting nutrition. So it's certainly not widespread, but something to, to talk about and plan for early on. Um, we, we often engage therapy services in the course of HD. Um, their observations were that a little bit later on the course of things, using physical therapy and occupational therapy can be more challenging. Um, they can be very helpful for finding um, assistive devices that are, are useful for a particular individual, but um, maintaining those skills and, and learning new skills can be really challenging, so may not be quite as effective. Speech ther therapy, however, was effective throughout the course. I want to jump now into talking a little bit about hospice care, which, which as I said, is not synonymous with palliative care. Hospice care um, is really applied to a particular time point in a person's disease course. And, and I like this initial phrase here because I think it gives that clarity. It's the fact that although hospice care is palliative care, all palliative care is not hospice care. Um, and so we apply the same principles of palliative care with a focus on um, goals of care and, and quality of life, but doing this in the later stages. To, to qualify for hospice and consider transition to hospice, a person must be um, thought to be within about six months of, of their life expectancy. Um, I'll show you here on this slide that that is not the only criteria that can allow a person to transition to hospice. Certain um, uh, sequelae of the disease itself and rapid decline a person may have can, can also uh, drive that transition. I think it's important to realize that studies have shown hospice care is largely underutilized. So it's a resource, as I said, that could be available for a patient for, for at least six months and, and provide an incredible support to the patient and, and care partners. But studies have shown that um, often it's a matter of days that a person is able to take advantage of those resources. And, and this likely is related to sort of this, this stigma around talking about hospice or considering hospice. Um, there's, there's a little bit of a misconception that it means we're giving up and, and not going to be doing anything anymore. When in fact, we're, we're sort of just shifting priorities, shifting goals, and really making every day um, as, as um, joyful and full of quality as we possibly can. Um, just want to leave you with a couple other um, tools that can help guide these types of discussions. We really, really feel that having these types of discussions early um, is beneficial because when a person's able to make those decisions and, and outline their wishes, we can respect that um, as the years come and the disease changes. 
overall, making these plans early can help to not only improve quality of life, but certainly allows caregivers and care partners to respect a person's goals um, moving forward, can help uh, family members cope with the disease, knowing that they are fulfilling the wishes of the person they love. Um, additionally, we know that having these early discussions does lead to earlier hospice referrals, so getting resources that can be really supportive um, and, and may limit more invasive and aggressive measures later, later in the course of things. Um, I'll leave you with a, a tool that is um, helpful to kind of structure this discussion. Um, and basically the HDQ life breaks down whether a person has thought about these things, taken any steps toward them, or completed any plans. And it can be a, a nice starting point to really think about what a person's goals and wishes might be. And then just several, you'll have these slides available, several other online resources that can be kind of conversation starters for you to, to really outline advanced care planning in HD. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Amy Hiller, and she's going to jump in into a really important piece talking about the resiliency tools that can be helpful. Thanks so much. I hope everyone can hear me okay. If they can't, please put in the chat box. Um, we had one question that came in right towards the end, um, Dr. Talman, and I think I can probably just answer it. Someone asked, if patients improve while using hospice care, then the care has to be discontinued, question mark. And um, yes, that is often the case. Um, and it's an important thing to note, right, um, that we do often have patients improve on hospice care. So um, it's not giving up. And oftentimes, um, it actually, people do better on hospice. I think depending on um, where you are and, and what's going on, sometimes there's a lot of resources available with hospice care that people don't um, have uh, access to otherwise. Um, so it's pretty common that we'll see improvements while people go on to hospice and then they come off. And that's kind of one of the best things we get to do sometimes is, is um, have people no longer, you know, appropriate for hospice because they don't need it anymore um, or they don't qualify for it anymore. So that's, that's kind of the outcome we want. Um, and when we see that, it's it's not considered um, considered a failure by any stretch, and and it's not uncommon that we'll have people kind of bounce back back and forth sometimes. Um, so uh, so yes, that that does happen, and at times people do do need to come off hospice, and also someone can stay on hospice for much longer than six months. So um, with uh, you know again, these palliative care was kind of traditionally within the cancer realm, and it's a it's a different entity than than we see with neurological disease, and it's not uncommon that that someone with Huntington's could live for years with, with that degree of symptoms, right? So um, we may see someone on hospice for, for you know, a year or two years. That's not, that's not uncommon. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things about palliative care and we wanted to really kind of stress is that it's not just um, end of life issues. It's this really thinking about quality of life. And I think um, there's the classic palliative care with, with palliative care providers. Um, but also one of the important pieces of palliative care is that can, it can kind of influence how, how we treat things in general. Um, and um, I think that uh, that's one of the, the the neat things about palliative care becoming more involved with um, neurological care is that we can kind of think of things a little bit different way and give us a little bit different mindset. Um, and so I have a particular interest in stress and um, how that affects neurological disease. And one of the um, aspects of that is thinking about kind of general resiliency tools. And so that's, that's one thing I wanted to talk about today. So the Merriam-Webster Dictionary of Resilience is the capability of a strained body to cover its size and shape after deformation caused especially by compressive stress or an ability to recover from or just easily to misfortune or change. Oh, uh, next slide, please. I forgot Dr. Talman's advancing the slides for me. Um, so on the next slide. Give me one second. Okay. It's misbehaving again. <laughs> Um, I can I can talk while she's while she's working on that. So um, when we think about resiliency tools, these aren't things that we um, want to figure out how to use in the moment, right? So so this is my example here. If here's the tornado, and then let's move on to the next slide. And I grew up in the Midwest, so so we um, had quite a a few of these. And um, and when the tornado comes you want 
to have your tornado shelter that you can jump in, right? But you don't want to be building this tornado shelter when you're seeing the tornado out the window. So resiliency tools are things we want to think about, things we want to try to, to develop and get comfortable with before we need them is the ideal. And I think one of the other things that's neat about resiliency tools is that um, they can be useful both for persons with Huntington's, but also for caregivers. We know um, that there's issues with stress in Huntington's, but there's also huge issues of stress with caregivers. And oftentimes, because um, the family themselves are at risk for the disease too, it just, there's so many layers here, right? And, and so much that, that can affect that way. So one of the pieces I wanted to talk about is spirituality. This isn't something that um, I have a huge comfort level with, but it's something that I'm wanting to improve my comfort level with. Um, there can be um, an involvement of spiritual needs within um, Huntington's disease. This could come from, from many different, different sources. Um, often spirituality plays a very big role for patients and families um, and has impacts on health, but it's not something that we real frequently discuss with medical providers. This is a fairly old study um, here, but I think it's still probably holds true that these are kind of kind of where we are. So up to 77% of patients they found would like to have spiritual discussions with, with medical providers, but only 10 to 20% engage in these conversations. Um, but it is coming more common that we're engaging this in, in medical education. And I think as, again, palliative medicine kind of seeps into to other areas of care, this may be something that, that comes up more. And I would be interested if people are comfortable putting within the chat box, and you might want to wait till I talk a little bit more. Um, if they would be comfortable with having a provider ask them questions about spirituality, if they would not be comfortable with that, um, just to kind of get a sense of, of, of where this audience is, if that, if that would be a plus or, or a minus. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a questionnaire. Again, this is from um, a paper uh, quite a few years ago now, but I think is really a nice way to think about how we would frame talking about spirituality within a, in a medical situation. Um, and also it doesn't, like we were saying earlier, or Lauren was saying, it's not necessarily religion, right? D people experience spirituality in different ways. So um, the H stands for hope. So asking the patient, do you have sources of hope, meeting, comfort, strength, peace, love, and connection? So are they, can you kind of describe to me to me what these are? Um, are you involved in organized religion? Um, and then the P is um, personal spirituality and practices. Um, and then E, the effects on medical care and end of life issues. So sometimes, um, you know, because of, the, of uh, certain specific religious ideals that may affect um, end of life issues. Um, or again, if it's more of a spiritual thing, it may be, I want these, um, things brought into my care. I want, um, you know, a certain prayer set or certain music played or, or things like that, because that for me brings a, a spiritual connection. Next slide, please. So I kind of put together, um, some of this was from the article and some of it was a little bit of mine of how a, a mock conversation might go. And I'll have two with slightly different, different responses. Though the doctor might say something like, for some people, their religious or spiritual beliefs acts as a source of comfort and strength in dealing with life's up and downs. Is this true for you? So this patient says yes. And then they say, are you part of um, a religious or spiritual community? And then the patient responds, I've been part of the same church for many years and have a strong belief in God. And then the doctor might ask, can you tell me the aspects of your spirituality that provide you with strength and comfort? And the patient says, I find prayer very helpful. It helps me deal with rough times and brings me calm when my mind starts to race a bit with worry. And then um, the, the doctor says, are there any practices or restrictions that I should know about providing your medical care? And the patient says, no, none that I can think of at this time. But this might inform the provider. So let's say, um, you know, they ask about a number of other things and realize the patient's having some trouble with sleep. Um, so then there might be, hey, do you use prayer to, to help you sleep? You mentioned that it helps your mind calm or when you wake up in the middle of the night and are thinking about all the things you have to do um, during the day, maybe Maybe that's a time to, to use that prayer that you said was calming to you. So um, that can be a, a, a role. Also, I think, um, you know, we do at times have chaplains involved um, 
generally with hospice, that's that's more of an involved role. Um, unfortunately, there's not um, a lot of chaplains actually just available um, with a lot of issues of medical care. So they're they're kind of a um, a, a tight resource. Um, but oftentimes, I might also talk with a patient about, oh, if you're connected with the church, is there someone there that you can connect with, or is there someone there that you can speak with? And I think again for um, some people, uh, they might not be comfortable with talking with a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but if they've got someone within um, a church community who they're comfortable um, with doing that, um, that, that may be a, a good source. And oftentimes um, people within church communities are comfortable, especially with things like grief counseling and, and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. So then here's another um, kind of mock session, how it might go. We've been discussing your support system. I was wondering if there are any things that give you internal support. And then the patient responds, yes, I meditate whenever I run into rough patches. I took a mindfulness course during college, and since that time, I found it to be a big help. Um, and then the doctor says, do you consider yourself part of a religious or spiritual community? And the patient says, definitely not. I consider myself spiritual and like to share experiences in nature with friends and family, but have not been comfortable with organized religion. Um, and then the doctor says, do you have specific spiritual practices that you find peace? And the patient says, getting out in nature has always brought me peace. And then the doctor says, has being sick has affected your ability to do the usual things that help you spiritually? If there, um, is there anything, I did a typo there, sorry, that I can help with to improve this? And the patient says, I don't feel like I can get out in nature like I used to. If you have ideas on how that helped me access nature more, that might be helpful. Um, so this I can think about, you know, in having this conversation um, that, that might make me think about a patient, let's say mobility issues are an issue that's pretty common in, in Huntington's. And especially things like hiking become difficult pretty early on in disease oftentimes. So we might be able to talk about, okay, you know, if you, you do can walk on a path maybe, but not a, you know, on a um, paved path. Path, but not on um, a trail. Maybe we can think about where are there some paved paths that you could get to, and um, and go for a walk. Um, I very often have patients who are in wheelchairs where the family can take them on a paved path and 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 take them out that way. So in knowing um, that this is important to somebody, we can then kind of try to troubleshoot. Are there ways to to incorporate that in? Next slide, please. So um, one of the, the pieces of spirituality um, kind of flows into the next part I'm going to talk about, but um, spirituality can be a source of relaxation um, for many people, and prayer meditation may be used to elicit this relaxation response. Um, and one example is focusing on a word or a phrase and disregarding other intrusive thoughts. And as I talk about mindfulness, you'll see this is really quite, quite similar, and mindfulness does kind of come from the, the Buddhist religion, but I think many religions have a very similar um, process that, that, that they entail, just slightly different ways of, ways of doing it. Um, it can result in decreased metabolism, rate of breathing, blood pressure, muscle tension, heart rate, and um, can result in increase in slow waves of the brain, which all suggest you know, a calming effect going on. And it's been shown to um, have positive effects in chronic pain, anxiety, insomnia, mild to moderate depression, migraine headaches, and then there's others as well, but those are kind of the big ones. Next slide. So um, this is moving on to mindfulness, and I find this image super helpful um, and better than, than kind of the classic definition, right? So is your mind full? Is there all these things going on, you know, um, having um, Huntington's disease or dealing with family with Huntington's disease? You've got a lot on your plate, um, and with all that's been going on in the world, I'm sure that plate's even fuller um, than it was. Um, but in the moments that you're, for, here's an out in nature example, right? Are you focused on what you're experiencing and able to enjoy that? So are you mindful of what's going on rather than thinking about these other things that, that you can't experience? Um, John Kabat-Zinn, who is kind of the father of, of modern day mindfulness, um, has one line I really like. Of, he says, when you're in the shower, be in the shower. So um, for, I love showers. It's a very relaxing time for me. Um, and um, think about that time as enjoying being in that moment and not thinking about, you know, don't be writing the letter that you need to get done. Don't be um, doing your grocery shopping because like, you can't actually do it right. You can't accomplish it when you're in that moment, but try to just enjoy um, the, the, the positive things of that moment. Next slide. So um, why is stress important in mindfulness and other techniques of stress reduction? Well, we know chronic stress does a ton to the nervous system, and I'm not going to go through this in depth um, at all, but just to show you that there's tons of effects that, that stress has. Um, and I 
think, you know, we keep trying to find ways to, to prevent these neurological diseases, these neurodegenerative diseases from progressing, um, and we often fail. We can treat symptoms sometimes, we don't do a good job at really stopping the disease progression. And often when we target things, we target one little thing. Um, and there's so much going on with diseases like Huntington's. I also work in Parkinson's a lot, same thing. Um, and one of the exciting things about stress reduction is we have the potential to affect a lot of these things. It's kind of the same, I think, with exercise, of the fact its power comes from the fact that it affects so many different things. Next slide. So just to give the formal definition of mindfulness, it's in a means of improving mental health and reducing symptoms of stress. It's a moment-to-moment non-judgmental awareness and a means to reduce stress and improve coping. Programs focus on tools to cope with intense physical and emotional situations, relax relaxation practices, such as meditation and yoga and discussion of these techniques. Next slide. And then this is just an example of kind of the classic mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, it's usually an eight-week session. The sessions are usually two hours a day, or two hours a week, excuse me, um, and meet once a week. And then they also um, do a lot of um, personal home practice. And, and the recommendation is usually an hour a day. I would say, um, having done these courses a couple times myself, most people do 15 to 30 minutes um, uh, on a on, on a good day. But um, they go through different topics, and then there's practices associated with that topic. And then these are usually done in a group format. So there's a lot that comes from the group um, as well. And then there's oftentimes a retreat included, which is usually a half day, day long retreat that comes, um, comes towards the, the end of the session. Um, next slide. And these MBSR programs are offered throughout the country. Um, wherever you are, I suspect there's, there's something near you. And usually the easiest is to Google mindfulness-based stress reduction. And, you know, wherever, wherever you are, oftentimes yoga centers are doing them. I know we do some um, through our hospital, actually. And then these are some of the big national centers that, that do a lot with them. Um, Brown University has a big center for mindfulness and does online courses, as does UMass Medical Center. They were kind of the... the um, early initiators of this. And I think some of the UMass people have moved to Brown. They're, they're close together there. And then UC San Diego has a wonderful um, recordings of different meditations um, online and you can download them for free. There's all different lengths, all different um, teachers. And depending on who leads the meditation, one voice may really agree with you and another may not at all. So um, it can kind of give you an opportunity to, to find these. And again, maybe good resources both for somebody um, with Huntington's as well as as um, the uh, caregivers and, and family as well. Next slide. So lastly, um, I wanted to touch on exercise. So this was a um, more recent paper um, that came out uh, to review what, what we know about exercise in Huntington's. Next slide. So this is kind of the, the classic um, table you always have to include when you do a review. Um, so they started looking at over a thousand articles and then they um, looked at them a little more closely and came down to 63. And then they only ended up using six in their study. So um, they really wanted um, high quality studies. And when they did that, they got to a very small number. Next slide, please. So um, what they came away with was that exercise seems to be safe and feasible in person with hun Huntington's disease. There were very few studies that were, that were rigorous and well done, um, and most of them were short term with a small number of participants. Um, revolt the results from the available studies are not necessarily applicable to all patients with HD. So there weren't studies across the spectrum of early, late, mid-stage, and so forth. Um, and really, at a conclusion we often come to in, in medical research, unfortunately, is that more research with larger numbers of participants um, needs to be done. But I think the fact that it's safe and feasible, um, you know, makes it, makes it something we should think about and consider. Um, I think from that earlier study that um, Dr. Talman talked about, you know, in later stage disease, physical therapy may not be the, the best or the easiest for someone to um, engage in. But uh, earlier on, um, you know, this can be something helpful. And again, we know that there's positive benefits of exercise in terms of stress and, and other um, more broad things for the, the body and the nervous system. Um, so this can also be something to, to think about for um, caregivers and, and family as well. And for all of us, really. Next slide. So this is showing some chair yoga. So even if, you know, there's, there's limitations um, in what someone can do, there are, are some things that, um, that, that can be done. Um, and, and physical therapists are the um, 
experts at modifying things to, to meet people's needs. So just because someone has some limitations um, doesn't mean that they, they can't do um, some physical exercise and things can't be modified. Next slide, please. So I, um, I know we want some time for questions. Um, maybe I'll ask Deb if we should try to do um, the mindfulness exercise or if we should just start, if we should go to questions. I partly put this in so we could um, either take up some time if we needed to or, or keep it short if we needed to. I think that uh, everyone on, online right now would appreciate the uh, exercise. Let's continue. Okay, great. So I'll um, do a short exercise here. Um, I don't consider myself an experienced meditation leader, but um, have had practice doing um, some visual imagery, mostly with my children as I'm trying to get them to bed at night, um, but also worked with um, someone who did a lot of mindfulness uh, meditation and does um, teach the courses. And he, he gave me the green light to, to go ahead. So um, Everyone can just uh, find a nice spot, um, ideally probably sitting, and you want to start with trying to sit very intentionally. So try to sit straight up if you can. Um, try to have your feet flat on the floor, so not just kind of slouched in your chair. And then for most people, it's comfortable to, to close your eyes. If that's not comfortable, that's fine. You can keep your eyes open. And we're going to um, think about being at the beach. We're going to think about that picture that was, that was just there. The beach is often a good place of, of relaxation for people. And you can think about yourself standing on the beach. You can think about your feet and see if you can feel the sand beneath your feet. It might be a little cool. You might feel the sand move in and out between your toes. And then think about how the rest of your body feels. You might feel sunshine shining on your arms and warming them or warming your face. And think about what you hear. Do you hear the waves crashing as the waves of the ocean come onto the beach? Do you hear birds squawking overhead? You might hear children running on the beach and playing. And then think about what you smell. Do you smell that salt air that's so common at the beach? And then you might picture yourself walking closer to the water and taking a seat on one of those chairs by the beach. And just try to think of letting your body relax. And again, feel that sun on your body. Listen to the waves as they crash. Take in all the scents and sounds and feelings that you'd notice as you relax on the beach. And I'm just gonna give everyone a moment to just sit here and think of what that experience would be like for you. And then I'll bring us back, maybe a couple deep breaths. And you may start to wanna wiggle your fingers and your toes a little bit. And then open your eyes up and come back to the group. Next slide. So in summary, we wanted to say that um, palliative care aims to relieve suffering by prioritizing quality of life. Palliative care should be considered at all stages of disease, so this isn't just um, something to think about in end stage. Spirituality, mindfulness, and physical activities are tools for resiliency in Huntington's, and advanced care planning is ideally performed early on in the, in the disease. Um, so I can open the chat now, and then maybe Lauren and I can both... Um, jump in with any questions. Um, someone mentioned that the planning tools are a helpful starter um, and that they're very comfortable with spirituality being brought up um, and um, expression from a caregiver that they would like this, this incorporated. Um, 
someone else that they're comfortable with the medical care bringing um, up religion. And then spirituality is very important in my son's life and my life as a caregiver. Um, and then someone mentions tending to see um, the fragilization of the HD patients and the focus on what they cannot do rather than um, tips on, on what they can do and how, how family members can, can function. Um, any tips on having this resiliency discussion with family members of the HD patient? Um, so, you know, one thing I, I like to incorporate a little bit of the, um, of the meditation, the relaxation, and somebody said how um, lovely that, that was, um, that I think when people do that, sometimes they're like, oh, that was so nice. Um, and, you know, and just saying like, oh, well, you can do that more. You know, this is, this is something we can, we can use as a tool. Um, and I, I think, you know, not saying that, um, all of us need these tools, right? This isn't just for people who are sick. This isn't just for people who are dealing with, with tough things because all of us have stress in our life. Um, so I think this is really a wellness tool. It's just like exercise, right? We, everyone's recommended to exercise, um, you know, 30 minutes. I think they say three to five days a week. Um, it's in my primary care doctor's office, you know, that they, they want everyone to do that. So I think maybe um, it doesn't need to be focused on you need this because you're dealing with that. If that seems like it would be, somebody would be resistant to that approach of it. Um, also, I think sometimes saying, you know, this is what I've done and this is what's helpful to me. And for me, the interest in mindfulness really came from, um, I was at UMass for a year as a fellow and did the mindfulness course and just found it so helpful for me personally. Um, and then I did have a, quite a few patients do it as well. I treated actually a lot of migraine patients at the time um, who found it really helpful. So, um, you know, being able to say, this is what I've done and I found it helpful, um, I think sometimes can help to normalize things too. And not that, oh, you've got a problem, so you better go, go get help for it. But um, that this is something that, that can be helpful for all of us. Um, I don't know if you want to, um, and Lauren, if you want to jump in at all, then there's a comment about spiritual, spirituality fitting well with medical treatment. Um, they liked the mindfulness moment. Um, how do you recognize that it is time to start the discussion on palliative care? Do you want to take that one? Or? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think, I think that's a, a good question, both for patients and families, but also providers, as I mentioned, we're all kind of navigating when is this a comfortable time? When, when should we bring up these discussions? And, and I myself am, just as Amy alluded to, we're all kind of working on our own practices. I think, the goal, as I said, once we've sort of built a relationship and, and I certainly would, would hope that there's a trust level between myself and, and patients and family, I, I don't think any time is too early, as I said. And, and all, going through all of that at once would be understandably quite overwhelming. That's why we think about some of these tools to help break things down and, and um, break things into different pieces so that we can a uh, little by little chip through some of these really important things to consider. So um, I think it's probably going to be different for every person and some people may not feel comfortable having that discussion and we respect that, but as, as much as pop possible kind of outlining things earlier rather than later while, while everyone can have that discussion together. Let's see, what else do we have here? Yeah. I think this was just, yeah, another person echoing that um, having that spirituality component um, brought up in the social work aspect, provider aspect, um, family aspect would be really helpful. So reiterating some of the prior comments. Absolutely. And I think there's a mention there too about primary care and that, that they should be bringing stuff up. I think, you know, there's so much on primary care doctors plates um, that it is, it is hard to, to, to find the, the time for these discussions sometimes. I also think um, there's sometimes a, a better understanding as a, as a neurologist who's followed HD over time. You know, it's not uncommon that I've seen multiple family members from the same family, a, a, a father and a daughter. Um, and 
so so we know the family in a different way than maybe a, a primary care doctor has over time um, and and I think that does allow us some some unique opportunity so and you know again with the palliative care having been more cancer care in the past neurology is getting more engaged and I think appropriately so because we do um, have these d different relationships with patients and different understanding of neurological disease and it's very different when someone personality changes extremely or they have significant cognitive issues over time um, and how how we're going to talk about end of life and, and manage those things um, and quality of life versus when someone you know has has a cancer that's going on but otherwise they are the same person um, so I think you know it's a very different different process that's going on in, in neurological disease um, and so I think sometimes if you know it seems like that the primary care doctors maybe aren't um, as comfortable with that uh, it, it makes sense because they're they're not dealing it in this within the same way that um, that we are and I, I think especially at the um, you know bigger centers that that we are hopefully taking on more of this and I think it is becoming more common um, I don't know if people are comfortable, but one thing I had done on a previous um, patient talk that was really nice was that everyone put on their cameras at the end. Deborah, are we able to do that? And then um, they could kind of look and see the community, and it was just kind of a nice, um, nice way of, of connecting with people, which we don't do very often these days with all the, the COVID issues going on. Um, I don't know if that's something. Sure, that if uh, people would like to uh, join Drs. Hiller and Tallman uh, for a few minutes, just go to the bottom of your screen and you'll see the, uh, the start video and there's an X through it. Just tap on that and your video will appear uh, alongside us. We do and have one more. We do have another question. Oh, sure. In. You may want to address that in closing minutes. Um, let me see. Any suggestions how to convince nursing home administrator to allow meditation for a resident? Don't seem to take it seriously. Um, so one practical thing I could think of is, you know, like I said, that UCSD site has great stuff on it. Um, so if you're able to, you know, like get an MP3 player or something where you can download some, some meditation um, and then have it available and ask them, like, could you just hit play, um, you know, at, at, at this time? Um, that might be a, a consideration. Sometimes within nursing homes, they do have internal hospice or internal palliative care providers. Um, and if that's the case, you may be able to reach out to them. And also they might be able to be an advocate for, to help, help you um, and uh, see, see if that goes. Those are my thoughts. I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that, Lauren. No, I don't think so. I think that's a great, great option. And someone else mentioned that the, the staff who's leading the activities at the particular facility could also be a good facilitator for that if, if the importance of it was brought up. Oh, and it looks like, it looks like we're not set up to see everybody's okay. shining faces, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, no problem. No problem. I, um, I also wasn't sure with recording if people would want their, their images recorded, um, but I had done some, some Parkinson's sessions early on with the Parkinson's Foundation um, when, when all the COVID stuff was going on. And we, we kind of got in the habit of doing that after doing it once because it was really nice to, to see each other. But we can know that we're all here together um, in spirit, which I think is, is a, a nice um, strength as well. Well, I see that we are out of time and I do just want to thank all of those who were able to join us today for this really uh, engaging and uh, thoughtful presentation on palliative care. Again, it will be available on the HDSA YouTube channel in about a week. Uh, you know, please do take time to uh, review it um, and uh, to view some of the websites and links that were suggested uh, for both palliative care and for mindfulness. I want to thank our speakers, Dr. Amy Hiller and Lauren Coleman, for taking the time today uh, to talk with us and um, for sharing a mindfulness exercise that I found really, uh, really wonderful. So thank you both so much, and um, and I hope you uh, enjoy the day. Thanks for thank having you. us. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye, everyone.